that again. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone, everyone today to Beyond the Ballot, Europe's Democratic Journey. Um, this new lecture series is hybrid in form and focuses on democracy, not just in elections, but beyond elections. Our first session today does focus on elections, a series of elections um, throughout the summer, um, but future um, topics this semester will focus on democratizing the EU, is there a need for institutional reform, and voices of concern, how are Europe's youth expressing their dissatisfaction with the state of democracy? Um, the series is um, put forward by the Center for Europeans, or the European Studies Center here at Pitt, and is sponsored by the um, Department of Education in the United States, as well as the European Union as a John Monet Fellowship. Um, I will be co-moderating today's session with JJ Spoon. Um, she will be taking over a lot of the role today, as I am. Um, joining remotely because I'm a little under the weather. So thank you, JJ. Um, we will introduce all of our speakers. They will give a brief um, summary or introduction to their particular election. And then we will have a series of questions that JJ and I will propose. And then we'll open it up at the end of the session to questions from the audience. Um, feel free for those who are joining virtually to either um, raise your hand or to your virtual hand, I should say, or to type your question in the um, chat box and we will call on you to pose your question. Thank you so much and I'll hand it over to JJ. Thank you, Erica, and welcome everyone. Um, as, as Erica said, um, uh, we will um, be, uh, I will be introducing our three um, uh, our three participants, and each will um, provide a bit of background on the respective election, um, after which we will um, have some questions from Eric and I, and then we will open it up uh, for Q&A. So hold your questions until, until the end. Um, and you may, of course, ask the question of one of our panelists or propose it to the whole group. Um, so first, I'm uh, pleased to uh, introduce Simon Hicks, who is the Steinbroken Chair in Comparative Politics at the European University uh, Institute in Florence. His research interests include comparative political behavior and institutions, in particular political parties and party systems, public opinion and voting behavior, electoral system design and legislative behavior, as well as the study of political behavior and institutions in the European Union. Simon is a fellow of the British Academy and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Um, next, um, I'm pleased to welcome Tim Bale, who is Professor of Politics in the School of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary University in London. He specializes in political parties and elections and the politics of immigration in the UK, Europe, and further afield. Some of his recent books include The Modern British Party System, The British General Election of 2019, Writing the Populist Way, Europe's Mainstream Right in Crisis, and The Conservative Party After Brexit, Turmoil, and Transformation. Uh, and our third uh, panelist today is Diane Bollet, who is a lecturer at the University of Essex in the UK. She specializes in voting behavior, public opinion, and far right politics in Europe. In particular, her research focuses on the role that changes in local context, media, and public policy can play in affecting political attitudes and behavior using observational and experimental data. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you. Uh, Tim, excuse me, Simon, would you like to start us off uh, with some thoughts on the recent European Parliament elections? Thank you very much, JJ. Thank you, Erica. Can everybody see my screen? I, I just prepared a few slides to give people some background. Um, so we had the European Parliament elections in June this year, and I'll say, a few, you know, one of the big things people talk about with the European Parliament elections is electoral turnout. Um, electoral turnout went up quite a bit in the last election in 2019, and there was a lot of discussion about whether it would go up again this year. It remained flat. So turnout in European Parliament elections compared to national elections in Europe is still pretty low at 51% on average, although around 10 points higher in the original eight EU member states. Um, I guess if you're sitting there in the US, midterm congressional elections also have a relatively low turnout. So although we might question the legitimacy of these elections, um, I still think they're significant for influencing the direction of the EU and Europe going forward. The big story from the elections was a major shift to the right in the parliament. So the, in, the hemicycle on the inside there is the makeup of the outgoing parliament. 
and the hemicycle on the outside there is the is the uh, makeup of the incoming parliament. As you can see, the shift the hemicycle has shifted rightwards. The European People's Party, that's the main centre right party group in the parliament, is the largest group and also finds itself in the middle of the parliament for the first time, with a significant increase in MEPs on the right, on the radical right, and split into three different groups on the right. Uh, the European Conservative and Reformists, that's Maloney and the Polish uh, PIS, um, Identity and Democracy, that's Le Pen and, and her allies, and Europe of Sovereign Nations, that's Orban and his allies. So you can see how this is a uh, populist right parties. Uh, they don't like the EU, but they also don't like each other very much. And hence why they end up sitting in different groups in the parliament. Perhaps we can get back to that. How important or how significant is this shift if we look across time? This is the sort of left right makeup of the parliament ever since it was first elected in 1979. And you can see there the 50 percent line across the middle. This is the first parliament where there is a clear right wing majority in the parliament. The median member or the average member of the parliament historically has been the liberal group in the centre of the parliament. There was a period in 89 where there was a left wing majority and it's gradually shifted rightward since then. You can see how there is now first time a right wing majority in the parliament. And if you look at the coalitions, and this will be important for thinking about the implications of these elections, the super grand coalition, as they call it, which is the coalition of the three centrist groups in the parliament, the EPP, the socialists and the liberals there, has shrunk in size, still just above 50% of the votes, but cohesion in voting in the parliament isn't 100%, so often that's not enough to rely on a, to create a, a stable majority in the parliament. And if you look down the, down the list there, the only other majority coalition is this populist right coalition with the EPP leaning rightwards. The EPP are saying we won't do business with parties to our right. The German CDE are saying we won't do business with alternative to Deutschland. We won't do business with Le Pen. Um, the, the election of von der Leyen or the re-election of von der Leyen as commission president was the super grand coalition plus the Greens. So in fact, EPP leaning leftwards, interestingly enough, Maloney and the groups on the right were very upset with that. And they are saying, well, you know, we won the election or there was a big shift rightwards that should be reflected in what the EU is going to be doing going forward. So it's going to be a very fractious period, I think, in the parliament going forward. When we look at voting patterns of the last parliament, there was clearly a left-wing majority on some issues, particularly on environment questions in the parliament. So this is just a this graph shows the percentage of time the majorities of each of the groups voted the same way, and the darker the colours and the higher the percentages. So you can see how this is all the votes on environment issues. There are about two thousand votes on environment issues, and you can see how the higher the, the high numbers are all there on the left, with the Greens voting with the Socialists, voting with the Renew group, and voting with the left. And that left-wing block of the left, the Greens, the Socialists, and the Liberals won a load of votes on environment issues, but very, very narrowly. That majority, that, that coalition of parties no longer has a majority in the current parliament. In fact, by the end of the parliament, the EPP were voting against that block on environmental issues under pressure from business interests and are now pressing von der Leyen and the commission to water down the EU's ambitious environmental agenda. And when we look across the EU institutions, now we've seen uh, the, 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 the designated uh, members of the incoming commission overwhelmingly on the right there with the EPP in a very dominant position. So, you know, we've seen a big shift in general in the EU institutions with the EPP, the centre right, in a very powerful position across the, the governments in the council, the MEPs in the parliament and the commission. And so they are going to be driving the political agenda going forward. This could be quite interesting to see what this does for the left in Europe, where the left in, on average has been more pro-European than the right. We did a survey ahead of the elections on von der Leyen, whether people knew who she was. Interestingly enough, 75% of respondents in the 27 member states could actually correctly name Ursula von der Leyen as commission president. You might say that's pretty low, but it's a lot higher than the previous commission president, Juncker. Only 40% could, could uh, correctly name Juncker. And in fact, the only other politician in Europe who people could correctly name in their post was President Macron. 76% could correctly name President Macron as the president of France. So she's got a very high profile. She has been re-elected as president and she has a mandate, you could argue, to govern as a result of the elections and the, and the victory of the EPP. What is interesting, though, we also found in, in that uh, survey was she's far more popular on the left than she is on the right. In a sense, she's a sort of centre-right Delors. She's the reverse of Delors. Jacques Delors was the last commission president who had such high profile. 
he was a left-wing politician who was probably more popular on the centre-right than he was on the centre-left. And she's a right-wing politician who's more popular on the left than she is on the right. In sum, I said I would keep it short so we can move on to the others. The, the, the European Parliament election was, as expected, a major shift to the right and a big breakthrough for the radical right, MEPs and radical right groups in the European Parliament. In, in fact, what we've seen in, in several countries across Europe uh, is the gradual rise of the radical right and then they reach a threshold where they sort of break through and they become really important for determining the direction of policy in the coming years and I think that is where the point we're at in the EU. The average MEP is in the EPP, a populist right bloc could actually govern at the European level. Von der Leyen has been re-elected, although she was elected with a centre-left coalition, the next commission will be dominated by the right with the EPP in a, having a majority of commissioners in the new commission. But people are already talking about what is she going to do with that mandate? What is she going to do with that majority? One thing being mentioned is a new European Defence Union, a sort of, could there be a von der Leyen commission, um, committee, like there was a Delors committee on economic and monetary union. But the other issues to watch, I think, are environment and migration, where the EU has had a sort of ambitious environment policy, a carbon neutral policy. I can see that being eroded quite quickly over the next few years. And if that happens, I think we will start to see the socialists at the European level start, move to be an opposition group in the parliament as the EPP was starting to behave as an opposition in the parliament about 10 years ago. Anyway, that's all I got. Happy to answer questions. Okay, great, thank you Simon for that very <laughs> all encompassing um, overview. So I think Erica and I both have some questions um, that we'll, we'll pose and, and again, we'll leave plenty of time later for other for other uh, questions from the audience, both here and uh, on Zoom. So I want to, I guess, maybe start with where you started, which is with turnout and the fact that we know that turnout although has increased in some places over the last 40, almost 40 years or so, or more than 40 years. But for the most part, it's still right, fairly um, Fairly low in comparison to you know when we look at national elections in, in many in many member states, and as you pointed out, average we were at a turnout of about fifty one percent in this election in June. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about um, the state of things when it comes to voting in the European Parliament. Um, we have obviously lots of lots of elections uh, since seventy nine um, and. Lots of uh, I guess the data points we can talk about, but just if you could sort of elaborate a bit more on why we see turnout on average still being kind of middling when we look at elections to the European Parliament. Yeah, I mean, Europe. The, the standard way I think we as political scientists think about European Parliament elections is as what we call second order national elections, and and second order means you know they're not as important as the first order elections, but the other element there is national. Don't forget second order national elections. They're overwhelmingly fought on na the popularity of national politicians, uh, popularity of the government. Overwhelmingly, opposition parties doing very well in these elections, and we saw that particularly in France. With, with victory for Le Pen, which I'm sure Diane will talk about. And, and we saw in Germany with the coalition parties in Germany doing very badly. There were a couple of cases where that was not the case. Though. Maloney did extremely well in Italy, won the election in Italy. Um, and a few other countries in Scandinavia, Social Democrats did surprisingly well throughout Scandinavia. So different patterns in different directions. On average, there's still second order elections. So voters are not that motivated to turn out. And when they do turn out, they vote in protest. However, there are some elements that are European in the campaign. And there were definitely, you know, migration was an issue in this campaign. Environmentalism was an issue in this campaign, particularly a backlash against the, the, the European Green Deal. Mobilization of, we saw protests all across Europe of farmers on the streets protesting across Europe against European Green Deal policies. And we saw the radical right in Europe saying, we're not just anti-European, we're not just anti-immigration, we're now actually anti-environment. So they gradually expanded their policy agenda Diane knows better than I do about this stuff, but but that's the impression I got following these elections, and that helped them broaden their coalition and appeal right across so many member states with a similar sort of platform. So yes, they're overwhelmingly still national elections, but I think there's a gradual, slowly increasing European element in these campaigns mm -hmm. for lots of voters. Not to ask you to predict the future or anything, but do you think that with, with the federal um, do you think as um, the 
We did your in the next election. I realize it's five years, so it hasn't been in five years, but do you expect that that's kind of the trend to see that turnout will possibly increase? I mean, it's a tall order when we're dealing with the second order elections and, and all the things that go on. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to predict turnout because so many esoteric factors influence turnout in European Parliament elections. What is going on in each country? You know, turnout was very high in Italy because it was the first election where there was a, a, a nationwide vote on Maloney, on Forza Italia without Berlusconi, on the PD with their new leader, and so on. So, you know, there's very esoteric reasons across Europe. It's very hard to believe. The other element I didn't mention is this the, the lead candidate idea of the, the European political parties putting forward candidates for commission president ahead of the election. So this has added another little element. Um, we've now had three rounds of this. Um, it's not significantly changed things. So, you know, we used to say, well, we're going to have PR in every member state, and then there'll be a high turnout. We're going to give the European Parliament more powers, and then there'll be a high turnout. We're going to create the Spitzen candidate, and then there'll be a high turnout. So I'm a bit sceptical when it comes to predicting the future. What would change it is if there really is a genuine battle for the Commission president. This might happen because we're gradually seeing a concentration of power in Ursula von der Leyen. There's been a lot of chat over the last couple of weeks about how she is centralizing power, a presidentialization of the Commission, she, if she if this becomes an EPP dominated uh, commission, it becomes a very politicized centre right commission. And if the left start to say we're opposed to this, they're going to start to articulate an alternative agenda for Europe. And that will be interesting where you'll start to see some real genuine left versus right mm -hmm. dynamics. And that could influence turnout and mobilization in the next election. All right, I'll hold you to it. We'll, <laughs> we'll check back. <laughs> Erica, do you want to pose a question? Yeah. I I wanted to pick up on something that you had mentioned in terms, and you just referred to again, in terms of von der Leyen and her, where her support comes from, right? I mean, she's clearly center right, but you mentioned that she actually is more, she has the support of these, of the center left, like where she has, you know, this more support than you would think, right? And that's a little bit of, even more unusual, I should say, when you think about the policies that that the EU in general, but the commission in particular, has begun to shift more right on, right, in terms of the environment or immigration, right? These were things that, that you know, have been criticized that in terms of that really rightward shift, and yet she still is supported by this center left, basically, more than within her own rightward coalition. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that. So a couple of things there. So one is a very general sense that the center left the progressive left are more pro-european than the than the center right and we've seen that trend in other research i've been doing with with bjorn hoyland we've, we've seen how the left have shifted and become more pro-european and the right have shifted and become more anti-european and that's largely driven by what the eu does the eu regulates markets it sets social standards it set environment standards um and and on average and the big the big thing she was she's known for apart from you know the act, eu action on ukraine and, and COVID vaccines, the other big thing she's known for is the Green Deal. That was the big thing she made. And the left very, very much supported that. And the right gradually over time became more and more anti von der Leyen's Green Deal, the EU Commission's Green Deal. This is European red tape imposing costs on businesses. The German CDU came out very strongly against this in opposition, backed by the German car industry. And they're trying to water down or get rid of the goal of abolishing the internal combustion engine by 2030. So, I mean, it's this is the sort of, she had this incredibly ambitious target. The German CDU, really didn't want her as commission president. It was even it was even alleged that Mertz, the leader of the CDU, said, well, if we could get rid of her, we we would have a, a different German politician as in the next commissioner. And the coalition deal in Germany would make it a green politician. And he he apparently said, we'd rather have a German green than a German green commission president. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um so I want to uh, also come back, Simon, to something that you talked about that, you know, I'm sure Diane will want to pick up as well when uh, talking about the French elections, but this not only shift to the right, but the shift to the Eurosceptic and maybe somewhat anti-EU right as well. And then, and, you know, the results that you were talking about, how many of these parties are now um, represented in much larger percentages than they were in the past. We have several Eurosceptic party groups. And to just, if you could talk a bit more about what it means for, you know, however you want to address this, what it means for, you know, one could, the, the functioning of the parliament, 
policies, et cetera, now that we have basically a quarter of the MEPs are from Eurosceptic parties? I'd say more than that, if you also count the Eurosceptic left. That's true. Um, yeah, that's true. Probably closer to a third or even 40 percent, you might even argue. Um, mm -hmm. And there's even some non-attached members who are from the sort of nationalist left, who are pretty anti-European. Uh, uh, Bundeswehr Wagnacht uh, from Germany, Smer from Slovakia. You know, the, these are very the sort of nationalist, anti-immigrant, anti-EU left-wing parties. So various different shades of Euroscepticism. Interestingly, the, the radical right, the populist right, have been toning down their anti-Europeanism. And this is partly because of Brexit, partly because of, you know, there very few of them are actually in favour of their country leaving the EU or even leaving the euro. But partly because they get into power and they get the reins of power and partly because they see that actually they could gain power at the European level and influence things. And they see Maloney and the influence she's had on migration policy, for example. And they see that, you know, they've met von der Leyen, as you, Erica, I think, was alluding to, has moved rightwards on migration policy, uh, particularly, and sucked up to Maloney and, they've, and pushed the deal with Albania and offshoring of migrants and pushing that agenda. And so the radical right, in a sense, are not so much anti-European anymore, anymore as saying we want a different kind of EU. We want a sort of fortress Europe, a protectionist Europe. They like the actions of the EU on, on tariffs on China. Uh, why can't the EU copy the US in its global tariffs? You know, if you, they could get hold of the levers of power at the European level, they could turn the EU away from it being a progressive left EU to a kind of nationalist, progress, nationalist uh, protectionist EU. And I think that's what their agenda is. They've got slightly different emphasis. I think part of the, the, the fight over there is who is coalitionable and who's not, who's beyond the pale cordon sanitaire and who's not. Um, the guys in ECR say we're inside the tent and we can do business with the EPP and we don't want to do business with the AFD or with Orban or Le Pen. Le Pen would desperately want to be inside the cordon sanitaire. And then, of course, you've got the pro-Russians, the pro-Putinistas. So you've got the sort of you've got Orban and AFD and a few other people over there. So various different stripes within the radical right, and they cannot get their act together so far. And I think that has weakened them up to this point in, in, in mm -hmm. policy making. Okay. Erica, do you want uh, perhaps one last question for Simon? Oh, sorry, less of a question, but more kind of an observation for you to reflect upon. Mm -hmm given your last statement. And, you know, we always in the past, in terms of these radical right Eurosceptic parties, they were very much, you know, they made their headway in the EP more, you know, earlier, and then at the, the subnational level earlier. And then now, you know, over the past 10 years or so, or maybe a little less, they've become, you know, viable groups at the national level. And I wonder to what extent that has kind of emboldened them at the European level and and yet and then so that's one thing and then but then yet as you've mentioned you know you have this inability of them even at the EP, at European level to coordinate themselves much less when you bring in the national parties which are kind of one and the same but not exactly um, I wonder if you can kind of talk about how they their agenda has been um, on the one hand enhanced um, but they've also moderated in terms of their skepticism because of this power at the national level as well as at the European level and the subnational level. Yeah, I mean, it's it's great that you've brought that up because the, the way to understand, I think, European politics these days is the interaction between the two levels. You know, we used to teach it and study it as two completely separate things. They're, they're inextricably linked now. So, uh, you know, when... There's a sort of ratcheting up. A party does well in the European election, it has implications on the next national election. A party does well in the national elections, it has implications on the next European elections. And there's this sort of, we've seen the ratcheting up of these populist right parties and gradually getting into power, either, either in coalitions or supporting coalitions from the back benches, as we've seen throughout Scandinavia, um, actually getting into government, as we've now seen in the Netherlands and in Poland. Um, on the verge of potentially getting into government, as we've seen in France. Um, and so we've seen, you know, this gradually ratcheting up. So I think they've now reached that threshold at the European level. And, and I was, I think a lot of them were, before the elections, there was talk about creating a new radical right group in the parliament that would bring them all together. And then they'd be the largest group in the parliament. But then they couldn't coordinate that. They couldn't coordinate that, I think, because of some scandals with AFD, because of arguments between Le Pen and Maloney. Um, and I think, uh, you know, power is a very powerful carrot. 
And so I think if there's a potential for them to actually get together, and I think we'll, it's going to be interesting to see what they do in some of the key votes coming up. They really coordinated to vote against the commission, a vote against von der Leyen as the commission president. Um, and they all voted on block, although it was by secret ballot, you could see in the results that they were all voting together against her. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do when the commission comes forward as a block for the vote in the parliament, because they they feel they haven't got the portfolios they have been promised and they haven't got the power they've been promised. And the EPP are really dominant and they don't like that. And they want to they want to give the EPP a bloody nose and say, don't look leftwards. You guys should be looking rightwards. And I think that's going to be very interesting to watch. Thank you. Of course, lots more to discuss, but I want to make sure other panelists have time and we'll we'll circle back to some additional questions, Simon, I'm sure from, from the audience. Um, I want to move on, as we said, we're doing this chronologically, so we're going to move on to the UK elections, which were on July 4th, this, uh, obviously this past summer, and Tim, uh, to let you, give you a chance to give us some uh, background on, on what happened. Great, thanks a lot. Well, uh, we had an election in 2024, which came on top of uh, the collapse of the Conservative Party's poll ratings uh, since they won an election under Boris Johnson in 2019. Um, partly because uh, Boris Johnson proved, as many people thought he would, uh, to be a Prime Minister completely incapable of doing the job and without integrity, which was proved by uh, revelations that they had been partying in Number 10 Downing Street, the seat of government in the UK, during COVID when everyone else was stuck at home. Uh, the Conservatives uh, went through a couple of uh, leaders after Boris Johnson. First of all, uh, a woman called Liz Truss, who managed in her very short uh, term in power, she was only in power for 49 days, uh, effectively crashed the UK economy as far as many voters were concerned. And she was then replaced by Rishi Sunak, uh, Britain's first ethnic minority uh, prime minister since uh, democracy came along in the late 1920s. Uh, and it was his mission, uh, he said, uh, to revive the Conservative Party's fortunes uh, by getting the economy back on track, uh, reducing the huge waiting lists in the National Health Service, our socialised form of medicine that had grown up since COVID and in fact before COVID uh, and also by uh, what became known as stopping the boats, uh, the uh, desire uh, of the British people to prevent uh, illegal migrants, as they were termed by the government, coming over from France in small boats in order to try and claim asylum uh, either uh, legitimately or not in the UK. Uh, unfortunately for him, he failed on virtually all those counts, although the economy did come right to some extent, uh, growth was very low, uh, the boats were not stopped, uh, more and more people came over, despite the government uh, legislating to send people who arrived here illegally, as they defined it, uh, to an African country for processing. Uh, and uh, the National Health Service waiting lists, which were very, very long, uh, seemed to go up rather than down. So on a whole host of issues, the Conservative government, which had been in power after all since 2010, uh, was in big, big trouble. So most people expected this to be a change election, and that is exactly how it turned out. Uh, the Labour Party, the main opposition to the Conservative Party, a social democratic party, uh, won the election with what is, in effect, a landslide majority. Uh, but the interesting thing about the election was that it won a landslide majority on uh, a very low share of the vote. So it won virtually two thirds of the seats in our parliament uh, at Westminster with only a third of uh, the national vote. And that vote was also very low. Although it was a chance for people to change the government after 14 years, uh, actually very few people, relatively speaking, voted. Only six out of 10 eligible voters actually went to the polls. Uh, we've seen turnouts uh, you know, quite low before, um, but normally we would expect something between two thirds and three quarters of people 
uh, to vote. So uh, many people are terming this uh, a loveless landslide uh, for Labour, as well as a collapse for the Conservative Party. And that collapse, it has to be said, was really precipitate. Uh, we have a Conservative Party that in 2019 under Boris Johnson won around 44% of the vote, but it actually uh, ended up with just 24% of the vote this time around. And that is really uh, pretty unprecedented for a party to lose 20% uh, vote share uh, in the course of one parliament is really um, something. Um, but um, the uh, other parties, uh, we don't just have a two-party system now in uh, the UK, we have a multi-party system, even if it's not always reflected in parliament, uh, are something that uh, people need to consider as well because the, the so-called third party in the UK, the Liberal Democrats, which are, if you like, a centrist party, uh, which stands somewhere between um, the Conservative Party on the right and the Labour Party on the left, actually did very well in terms of seats in this election, which is quite unusual for them. Very often in British electoral history, the Liberal Democrats and their forerunners, the Liberals, uh, do um, quite well in terms of vote share, but do appallingly badly in terms of seats because their votes are spread right across the country. This time, however, the Lib Dems really did effectively gain the system and won all sorts of seats from the Conservatives, primarily perhaps as a result both of their targeting strategy and as a result of if, what's sometimes referred to in the UK as tactical voting. So many people uh, who might otherwise have voted Labour but wanted the Conservatives out in their particular district, what we call a constituency, voted Lib Dem instead. So on a very similar share of the vote to what they got last time around, 11 or 12 per cent, um, the, the Lib Dems went up from just eight seats to uh, just over 60 seats in Parliament. So again, um, you know, something that really illustrates, if you like, the weirdness of the first past the post system uh, in the UK. But they weren't the only so-called minor party to uh, benefit uh, at this election. Um, the uh, big news was the performance of the Populist Radical Right Party reform, which we've seen actually in um, different guises over the years. It started out as the UK Independence Party campaigning for Brexit, then turned itself into the Brexit Party in 2018-2019, uh, and then after we Brexited, it turned itself into Reform UK, uh, with an emphasis on um, uh, anti-immigration politics and also campaigning against woke and political correctness in all its forms, and also campaigning against uh, uh, what they see as too rapid a move towards uh, net zero. Uh, they have a very charismatic uh, leader in Nigel Farage, who occasionally does come over to the United States in order to support someone he calls his friend, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, in this election, he had, it was assumed, decided not to actually fight uh, a seat, although he was going to be leader of the party, but he changed his mind into the campaign, and that seemed to absolutely dynamise support for Reform UK. Uh, and as a result, Reform UK managed to garner around 12, 30 uh, percent of the vote. However, uh, they suffered from the um, problem that the Liberal Democrats normally suffer from in that it, their support was relatively thinly spread. So for around the same and in fact slightly more votes than the Liberal Democrats got across the country as a whole, instead of 60 odd seats that the Liberal Democrats got, reform ended up with just five seats. Having said that, however, that is seen as something of a breakthrough for reform. Uh, the um, populist radical right in this country has never had that many seats in Parliament, uh, and it does constitute a bit of a bridgehead, perhaps, for them. Most of their votes, it has to be said, came from disillusioned Conservative supporters. Um, there was another party that did quite well as well, and that was the Greens. Uh, they have tended, like the Liberal Democrats, uh, to do relatively well sometimes in terms of vote share, but actually do pretty badly in terms of seat share. Uh, this time uh, they did you know, fairly well. They got 7% of the vote uh, across the UK as a whole, and they managed to turn that 
into four seats, which is three more seats than they've ever had before. Uh, and their um, support came mainly from disillusioned Labour voters who felt that Labour, um, which had moved in some ways to the centre since 2019, wasn't offering a sufficiently radical alternative uh, to uh, the Conservatives. The other story of the election, and I'll begin to wind up now, uh, was the collapse of the Scottish National Party uh, in Scotland, uh, which went from um, 40, uh, 48 seats, uh, I think, to just nine seats. So, you know, a, a really, really bad performance on their part. And most of those seats uh, and most of those votes were lost to Labour. So we have, uh, to sum up, uh, a very fragmented uh, party system in this country. Uh, and yet we still cling to uh, the first past the post system. Uh, and when you have a very fragmented party system, as well as a plurality system, you can get some very odd results. Uh, and as I've said, in some ways, we had some, uh, a very odd result this time around. We have a Labour government that actually was not particularly popular, certainly wasn't brought into office uh, with a huge wave of enthusiasm, and yet has a huge overall majority in Parliament. Uh, so we shall see uh, how that turns out uh, over the next five years. There's not much uh, chance of the government collapsing uh, before then, I think, however unpopular it might get. Uh, we shall see how the Conservatives manage to respond to the collapse in their support. They're currently going through a leadership contest at the moment. The same goes for the SNP, the Scottish National Party in, in Scotland. And we will also see how um, the Liberal Democrats in particular uh, manage uh, to, uh, to uh, establish themselves with, as I say, I said just over 60, I meant just over 70 seats in Parliament, more than they've had for a very long time. And then I think uh, the big, big question is what happens to the populist radical right uh, reform party under Nigel Farage? Does it just disappear and dissipate, as sometimes has happened before? but has or has it established a bridgehead which leaves it in a position to take votes perhaps from Labour as well as Conservative next time around. Great. Um, thank you for all of that. I have way too many questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, maybe we could just start, um, uh, Tim, perhaps talking a bit more about the Labour Party itself. Yeah. And a bit about how Labour was able to come back from, you know, 14 years in the political wilderness again. And, you know, maybe talk, and a bit about Starmer himself and sort of how he reformed, maybe not reformed, but really sort of reinvented, let's say, the Labour Party. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a really good question. Um, for people who don't know, um, Labour lost the 2019 election really, really badly. It was their worst defeat since uh, 1935. Uh, it was under a very left-wing, uh, ultra-liberal leader called Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who had taken the Labour Party uh, in a, a leftward, uh, ultra-liberal direction since he took over in, in 2015. Uh, it was good for the party in some ways, and it really boosted membership, but it was bad for the party electorally because uh, many voters thought that Corbyn himself was unacceptable. Keir Starmer took over in uh, 2020 uh, after a leadership contest. Uh, it was a very difficult start for Starmer because it was right in the middle of COVID. So it didn't really give him much of a chance to kind of establish himself with the British electorate. And in some ways, perhaps um, the, uh, uh, you know, what we're seeing now and what we saw in the election is a bit of a, a hangover from that. Uh, he uh, became, I think, you know, reasonably um, regarded by the electorate, partly because he wasn't Jeremy Corbyn, partly because he wasn't Boris Johnson, nor was he Liz Truss or Rishi Sunak. Uh, but he never scaled the kind of heights of popularity uh, that uh, Tony Blair uh, achieved when he led Labour from 1994. What he did do, however, was essentially establish uh, discipline within the Labour Party, by which I mean uh, marginalise the left, even to the extent of actually suspending and eventually, in effect, kicking out Jeremy Corbyn, the former leader from the party. Uh, and uh, also, I think, 
communicated to the electorate that the Labour Party had changed, that it was moving right back to the centre, uh, ideologically speaking. It was once again a, a kind of pragmatic, uh, centrist, social democratic party that could be trusted uh, with government. And that was important not just actually for um, Labour, but it was very important for the Liberal Democrats. Uh, there is a pattern in, in British politics that when Labour is trusted uh, by uh, the electorate, then uh, the Liberal Democrats tend to do well. Uh, when Labour is not trusted by the electorate, uh, the Liberal Democrats tend to do badly because many people tempted to vote for the Liberal Democrats vote for Conservatives instead in order to keep Labour out. That didn't happen this time around. So you'd have to say that Keir Starmer's leadership of the Labour Party in opposition uh, while it wasn't stellar, was incredibly effective. To go from your worst defeat since 1935 to you know, one of your best performances in 2024, so in just one parliamentary term, is really quite incredible, really quite impressive. Thank you. Erica, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, um, so mine follows up on kind of this labor theme and or more just of the left in general because, I mean, labor's... The you know, renewed success is very much because they've moved right to the, and have a have a slightly better leader than they had before, a better leader, not so much left wing. But I guess my question is kind of what's left for the left in 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 the UK? Who do they vote for other than the Greens? Um, well, I mean, the stuff. Yeah, I mean, you. I think ask a, a a very good question there. I think in terms of the Labour Party itself, it lost a lot of members as a result of this transformation from you know, the, the Corbyn uh, years to the, the Starmer years. Um, Corbyn put on an awful lot of members, a lot of younger uh, people, uh, and a lot of people who actually rejoined the Labour Party after leaving it uh, under Tony Blair because of Iraq and because what they saw as his kind of you know, um, uh, neoliberal policies. I think they were mistaken in that, but that's how they described them. Um, but um, I think Keir Starmer uh, essentially um, decided that you know most people on the left uh, had nowhere else to go but the Labour Party. Now it turned out, as you hinted there, that actually they did in some ways have other places to go. Some of them voted for the Liberal Democrats, partly in order to register an anti-conservative vote, and many of them voted for the, the Greens. Uh, interestingly, since the election, straying a little bit from the election itself, uh, we've seen a suspension of seven Labour uh, left-wing MPs for voting against the government very early on in its life. And we may, in fact, see uh, the formation, if Jeremy Corbyn has anything to do with it, uh, of uh, a left-wing alternative, which will encompass actually uh, not only those left-wing MPs, if they're tempted to join him, but also something I didn't talk about during my um, spiel on the election, which was the, uh, the four or five um, uh, independent MPs who were elected in very heavily Muslim population districts. Uh, and uh, that occurred partly as a result of um, Labour's support for uh, Israel, uh, and uh, some remarks that Keir Starmer made very early on uh, in that conflict uh, about Gaza. Uh, so uh, Labour does have to worry some, I think, uh, in not only, as I say, got a big majority on a very low share of the vote, but it did lose support to the Greens, it did lose support to non-voting, and it did lose support in some Muslim areas to these independents. Uh, so... There, there is some hope, I think, for, for people on the kind of left or the far left of politics that they will be able to establish a party. But whether that party will actually be capable of winning many seats in Parliament uh, with our first-past-the-post system, I think, you know, remains to be seen. Simon, I see your hand up. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask Tim a question. Um, and this was really about the, the turnout uh, dynamic here, because... Um, how much of that, in your view, was driven by the fact that just people expected Labour to win it? I mean, ahead of the election, Labour were running close to 50% of the votes and it collapsed in the last week of the campaign. Yeah. I remember my kids, uh, you know, typically left-wing young Brits saying, I'm not voting for Starmer, I'd rather stay home, knowing full well he was going to win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, what, you know, 
uh, it was quite striking. If you actually look at the numbers, Labour actually lost votes. They they got fewer votes than they did last time round, yeah, and the Tories yeah. actually got less than half of the votes they got last time round. Yeah, so yeah. was there some evidence of there being much higher turnout in the marginals? Because clearly they targeted the campaign, they targeted yeah. the votes, both Labour and the Lib Dem. So was yeah. there some evidence of there being just much higher turnout in some places than in the sort it, of very... Interestingly, no. Um, you would expect that to be the case. I mean, there, there was slightly higher turnout, it has to be said, or, or slightly less of a collapse in turnout in the, in the gains that they were made from the Conservatives. But actually, um, although, you know, those constituencies saw a higher turnout than, than the constituencies where Labour held um, seats and were expected to win very easily, obviously, uh, you know, it, it wasn't that high. I, I think you've made a very important point there. I don't really need to tell anybody here because you're all students of comparative politics that the, you know, the, the two things that lead to low turnout are a, uh, a pretty foregone conclusion as far as the result is concerned and b a feeling that there isn't as much difference as perhaps there might be or should be between the two main contenders. Uh, and that, I think, is you know uh, true in spades in this election. So in some ways, the low turnout doesn't entirely surprise me. But I, I do think, although it's anecdata, um, you know, from your kids, but also from my kids, that <laughs> there's an extent to which, um, you know, young, idealistic, uh, progressive uh, voters, uh, if they didn't vote Green, um, stayed at home because they just didn't feel infused by Keir Starmer. I want to pick up, and then uh, Erica, I will give it over to you. Uh, I want to pick up on that point about sort of younger voters and also um, uh, sort of Erica's point earlier about sort of what's what's to make of the left and talk a bit about the Greens. Um, as you know, I'm always interested in the Greens, so you should talk. <laughs> um, and the fact that, you know, the they, um, as you said, right, they received 7% of the vote, which is a bit higher than they have in the past. But really what was um, fairly um, incredible is the four seats, right? They've sort of bumped along with one seat um, for, for quite a while. And perhaps you could talk a bit more about sort of what did the Greens do to get themselves uh, to that four seats? And really was this just a function of everything that you talked about in terms of um, Labour moving more to the centre and lift it, you know, the sort of the constellation of the party system, um, or was this a combination of that and sort of what the party itself was doing, or was it to, to just to kind of talk a bit more about what explained that um, that increase in, in seat share? Well, I mean, I think uh, it's all the above, really. I think the Greens were very um, good at targeting this time around. I mean, they do tend to do better in university towns and cities uh, you know we've known that for for quite a long time but particularly for example in the race in bristol uh, where they actually beat an aspiring labor cabinet minister uh, you you could really see them pour resources into that particular seat in, in bristol um, they did the same to defend the seat that they've had for some time in, in Brighton pavilion uh, they actually managed, managed also to win a seat uh, against the Conservatives, and I think that had something to do with a general concern uh, among um, some middle-class, rural, uh, and indeed some urban dwellers, about the mess that the Conservatives have made of um, the environment in terms of water quality. Um, it might seem like a fairly minor issue to some of us, uh, but for anybody living by the sea, as I do, or living by rivers, as many people do, uh, it's actually the, the sewage problem uh, is, is a very, very big concern. And the, the Liberal Democrats and the Greens, I think, were able to mobilise that uh, really effectively. I think it also has to be said that Gaza made a difference as well. Uh, the Green Party isn't just, as you know, JJ, I don't need to tell you this, it isn't just an environmental party. It is very much a kind of left liberal party uh, as well. And the Greens had a much... Uh, harder uh, stance on Gaza in, in the sense of, you know, being willing to criticise Israel, um, not defending Hamas, but certainly showing a great deal of concern about, you know, what was going on um, for the population uh, in, in Gaza. And I think many, uh, particularly younger people, who were upset with some of the remarks that Keir Starmer made on that conflict uh, and, uh, you know, felt that... Uh, 
and mm -hmm. Labour needed to take a stronger stance uh, in the end, and partly um, because of something Simon said, uh, they knew that Labour would win anyway. There was no danger of a Conservative government for able to vote for the Greens. Why don't we go to Diane? And I have I have more questions, but we can always come back. Um, Diane, right. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for your patience. And um, so thanks for inviting me. It's been, a, as you know, a highly eventful uh, election year for France, marked by the European elections and then the subsequent two round legislative elections. Um, so I will highlight three points that kind of emerge from those elections. And I think they represent really well what we can think about those elections. So the first one is, unsurprisingly, the rise and mainstreaming of the radical right. Um, the second one is about how these elections really represent the existing political cleavages that we see, not just in France, but the rest of um, European democracies. And then the final point would be more about a perspective point on the institutional lessons of these elections for the uh, French Republic. So first, it's quite undeniable that the national rally has gained significant support in these elections. So the party emerged as a top performer in both the European elections, and that's also what kind of prompted Macron to call for the snap elections. And they also performed really well in the first round of the legislative elections. Um, and in total, they increased the number of MPs from 89 in 2022 to 142 in 2024. So they gained about 12 million voters, which is huge. Um, but what we witness in the second round is um, what the French love to call this Republican front. Um, so it's in a situation where, so we have a two, so it's a runoff election. And the second round, um, given the high turnout that emerged in this legislative elections, every candidate that performed higher than 12.5 uh, percentage point, uh, percentage in election will directly go through the second round. And so we ended up in a situation where we called the triangulaire. So we had three candidates. So one national rally candidate and then the two others representing either the central liberal or the kind of left candidate. So I should, I should mention here that um, 48 hours after the uh, snap elections were called, the left managed to unify and form an alliance under what they call the popular front. So it included the ecologists, the socialists, um, the communists and uh, Mélenchon's party more the radical left. And so what they did is um, the third contender, so the non-far right candidate, um, whether it's in the central liberal or this popular front, um, decided to withdraw in the second, so between the two elections, to allow a better chance of defeating the far right contender. And so this Republican front um, turned out to work as the far right underperformed in the second round of the elections. And so what we ended up with was three blocks with the socially progressive, so this popular front, this, it's kind of reached a ceiling, uh, a ceiling point, but they unified together uh, on the left. We then have the central liberal front, so which is Macron's party, um, which has lost a lot of support uh, from the 2022 elections. They used to have a relative majority. They don't have it anymore. And they reached all time low on popularity, especially um, towards Macron. And then the, the last block is the socially conservative, so the nationalist with the national rally. But none of these three blocks um, won a majority, whether it's absolute or relative. They got, each of them got a little bit less than a third of the electorate. But it didn't really mean that a national rally uh, completely lost, and it's especially given what's been unfolded since the election. So the last few weeks have been particularly uh, eventful um, in France with the appointment of the prime minister and the way he was uh, uh, endorsed by the national rally is quite interesting. So we have a new prime minister in the name of Michel Barnier. Uh, he comes from none of the three blocks I really talked to you about. He comes from the right wing party, the traditional right, the kind of gaullist, uh, very socially conservative. And his party only secured on uh, 22 seats, right? So it was not a clear winner of the legislative elections. Yet he was named, appointed as um, the prime minister. But what was interesting is how he got appointed. So he has been directly endorsed by the radical right, where Marine Le Pen and Jordan Badella were uh, playing key roles in selecting him. They even vetoed previous candidates, whether it's from the right uh, or from the left, like Bernard Cazeneuve. 
And that kind of, to me, is a signal of the collapse of the cordon sanitaire and of what they called during the election this Republican Front that was designed to block the far right. Now it seems that Macron is trying to uh, compromise with the far right as a way to secure social economic policies, because appointing someone from the left wing party would have meant putting his controversial pension reform and other economic policy into, uh, into question. And Macron was kind of ready to uh, concede some more socially conservative views by appointing a prime minister that comes from the social conservative front. So the newly announced cabinet, which was just announced two days ago, is a right-leaning alliance um, with some continuity from previous ministers and portfolios. So we have uh, some members from Macron's party, but we also have uh, more um, represented of these, as I said, this kind of right-wing front, including the new uh, Minister of Interior, um, who pushes for a hard line on immigration and has ideas that are very close to what the radical right would say, which is a kind of a step towards the mainstreaming of the far right with the adoption of this kind of views in government by representatives not necessarily from this party, but who may have similarities in terms of sharing the social cultural new, um, values. So to me, this is a sign that step closer to bring the far right closer to power. Now, there's another point which is more related to what I've been doing, but I found it fascinating that during the legislative election, there's also been the role of the media and especially uh, of CNews. So we have our Fox News style new uh, uh, kind of popular uh, evening program that was launched by our Murdoch-like figure, Vincent Bolloré. And he has, th this program has significantly increased the visibility of radical right forces and those themes. And what's striking is that during this election and during the campaign, reports from the National Rally voters mirrored constantly the media narratives what we heard on rising crime and insecurity. So this is another like key um, uh, power and, and forces that contributed to the rise and mainstreaming of the radical right. So now we'll see what remains to be seen. The right group is still part of the opposition. Uh, it can still block uh, the uh, incoming reforms, especially on the, the they're going to talk in the National Assembly about the uh, suspension of the uh, pension reform at the end of October. So it'll be interesting how much they're going to veto this new uh, this new cabinet. Now I'm going to be brief from the last two points, but I'm, I think what's also interesting with those elections is how they embody this existing political cleavages that we see in Western Europe. So now we have this kind of tripartite political system with these three blocks, the center liberals, uh, even though in France it's kind of lost significant support, right, with the unpopularity of Macron, uh, the social progressive and the social conservatives. And they tend to exist along geographical divides, right, the rural areas that were supportive of the national rally and uh, peri-urban, urban rural, uh, all more voting for the left. We also see some gap along, which I think is quite interesting, uh, age, age and gender. So we tend to see younger women supporting more uh, socially progressive, so the popular front, the left alliance, and young men being more supportive of the national rally. Um, now, I think we should also consider what are these uh, institutional lessons from, from this election. And, and we are clearly witnessing the limitations of the Greek Republic that's supposed to, so we have in our imagination as a Frenchman, where we learn about uh, the Republic is to have a strong and clear political majority with one uh, strong uh, party. Uh, we don't have any of this. We have the three blocks that, and as I said, it, you know, it tends to resonate with what we witness elsewhere in Europe. But the problem with France is the lack of culture towards coalition and compromise, right? So, and that, except if it's within the same political spectrum, and then tends to create a real political paralysis. I should remind that the last two months there hasn't been any meaningful reform that been passed or no effective governance. Um, and I think this is something that unfortunately we don't discuss much in uh, right now in the French debate, but that has to lead to maybe more reforms, whether it's electoral reforms, uh, having a, a votes that are um, translating, so vote shares into seats more effectively, more genuinely. Um, so implementing the P, uh, PR, pro pro proportional uh, representation, which is something that Macron is actually talking a little bit about. And funny enough, it used to be a big topic for the radical right in the past, but now that they actually 
you know, winning with this current majoritarian system, they actually want to make a pause on this. And they openly say they actually will oppose any reform on PR. Anyway, those are like my three points and main takeaway from these elections. And I'm happy to talk more about one of each of these points. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Erica, do you want to start with the first question? My question, I guess, comes back to um, something you you alluded to already, or two things you alluded to already. And one is kind of the French left, right? Kind of where, what has become of them? Yes, they were able to rally to kind of unite to prevent the far right from being successful in the second round of legislative elections. But, you know, kind of where have they gone? Like, who, who are those voters now voting for? Is it a, is it a, you know, are these young voters that you talk to in terms of the females, male and female voters who vote for the radical right? Are they, you know, are they, are the young people still voting for the left at all? I mean, where have they gone is one thing. And then two, um, I guess, well, let's focus on that one. Sorry. Um, yes, no, this is this is a great point. So um, I should mention that the, the the alliance of the the United Left was defying everyone's expectations, including Macron, because one of Macron's grand plan was to count on no alliance among the left. Um, what was impressive is how they managed to come up with the program in less than 48 hours. And they agreed on several things, including uh, well, mostly social economic positions, so rejecting the controversial pension reform, advocating for a wealth tax, prioritizing uh, the just transition and the Green New Deal, and pushing for uh, even more for this. And that, I think, was a, a this alliance proved highly successful um, by really coming up and appearing as competent for this election. And that kind of appealed a lot of voters, and especially the left. Uh, well, especially the young and the, those living uh, in peri-urban areas and with higher, uh, in areas with higher ethnic diversity, right? So this is kind of where the most of the left vote is coming from. Now, I should say that since uh, this elections, this alliance has weakened, weakened a lot. And that's uh, for various reasons, one being that Mélenchon is an incredibly polarizing and controversial figure and his position on the war in Gaza and uh, has really made him incredibly unpopular, even among people from his own party. So we're starting to see a lot of factions. So in the set, during the, the the campaign for the second the second week for the second round, that there were actually a sort of a uh, a kind of war, war in war battle between different candidates from Mélenchon's party, which lost created some. Um, uh, lack of credibility of the party and harmed the more, um, I should say, center, center left, some of the socialists and the ecologists, who since that uh, episode have tried to really distance themselves from uh, Mélenchon's party, right? So there's been a bit of a shift from the election, which was kind of created as an ele electoral strategy, as one common enemy, which was to block the far right. Since then, there's been a lot of uh, shaky divisions. And now we're starting to see, especially now that um, Mélenchon is uh, remain all time low and popular, we're starting to see that the Socialist Party, and especially key figures of the Socialist Party, like uh, Hollande, for instance, are really trying to come back and declare the uh, unity of the party and gain and engage with the voters. If that makes any sense. So I want to um, pick up on the institutional lessons, Diane, that you sort of left uh, your last point. Um, and actually, it was very interesting. My question is not on this, but you're probably, but I thought it was really interesting the point that you made about the the that Le Pen and the Rassemblement National are no longer in favor of PR. Um, I actually just spent a bunch of time in my class yesterday talking about the 1986 elections and how the FN did what was the Front National under. Jean-Marie Le Pen did so well under under that brief electoral change before it then shifted back to majoritarian and they lost all their seats. So it's an interesting sort of shift there. Um, but what I did want to ask you about, um, feel free to talk more about that if you'd like, is the fact that for the first time, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we have a minority coalition in, in the government. Um, first time since 58, I think, in the Fifth Republic. So this is a huge institutional change in 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 in, in France that we now have um, a minority coalition um, in in the government. And so I was wondering if you could sort of talk a bit more. And I know this is 
brand new, right? The coalition was, you know, the, the, the cabinet was just announced yesterday. So this, you know, haven't had a lot of time to really sort of process this, but just what this means for sort of governing in, in France. Also, this is a very, as you said, you know, sort of wide coalition. Um, yeah. But obviously with the two opposition blocks out of government, right? The, the far right and the left, right? So this is very, you know, sort of center right, right leaning, but fairly, but fairly broad. So I wonder if you could just, you know, again, this is fairly new, new that we're sort of all kind of thinking about this and learning about what what this means. But just kind of some of your thoughts on. It. Um, yeah, no, this is the great points, and I think this is what um, we've been talking a lot in France at the moment. So I think there are two points. So the consequence of this minority government, um, this for the voters is 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 quite interesting. Um, because we kept hearing people saying that it's undemocratic, that this uh, result is actually not reflecting the result of the legislative elections. Um, there was just, I saw a poll this morning on uh, in Le Monde that said this only 9% of French voters thought the uh, the result was actually mirroring the results of the legislative elections. So there's a lack of a mandate coming from the voters, which I think will make it really difficult to pass any reforms that will gain um, wider support. Now, in terms of governance, as I said, we're currently in a very difficult situation. It's like a stalemate, the political paralysis. But on top of that, um, the we entering turbulent times when it comes to economic policy with France. So France has a really large deficit, and there's been a lot of discussion about uh, coming up with a, a budget. Uh, by the end, it was supposed to be by the end of this week. Uh, it's very unlikely it will happen. But by the 1st of October, Matt Barnier has to come up with a strategy uh, to uh, reduce about 10 billion euros. And that's to comply with Brussels because we're in a uh, fiscal deficit. That, I think, we create a lot of um, uh, a lot of rejection and opposition from the rest of the uh, assembly because they're probably going to be uh, position towards slashing public spending, knowing where uh, Barney is coming from, is more of a social conservative um, and common cons conservative. And, and I think that will have uh, real consequences. So right now, the, 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 so the parliament, but the, the, the assembly can't actually uh, ask for a vote of no confidence. It has to be engineered by Barnier, who will probably not ask for it because he knows he'll probably lose. Uh, but one thing that the opposition could do, so the opposition being the left and the national rally, is to block uh, any, uh, any reforms. And the first one will be on the budget. Um, it'll be interesting to see, so the, the left has already declared they will uh, veto all of them. It'll be interesting to see what the national rally will do. Um, but there remains to be seen. Um, but I would I would suspect that um, maybe calling for another election in 10 months time might not be, <laughs> no longer be a surprise in the French uh, turbulent times that we live in. Great, thank you. It's definitely uncharted territory. <laughs> for the... Can I ask a question to Diane? Yeah. Yes. I found this absolutely fascinating, brilliant uh, presentation. Thanks. Um, uh, what does this mean for the next presidential election? What's the chat in France about this? I mean, has yeah. has you know, Ma this was Macron's big gamble, and there was this big fight with some people saying, "Oh, he's such a genius," and some people saying he's a complete idiot. And and you know, the whole idea was to essentially kill her off so that yes. she's the main candidate for the next presidential election. So, what's your perspective on that? I mean. I my my perspective always to listen to what the voters are saying as a whole, and the majority say it was completely stupid, and most of that came from his party himself. So he really uh, dis uh, isolated himself with this snap elections, and we saw that with Attal's position. It was quite interesting to see how he always trying to uh, oppose some of Macron's um, views. So this what we're talking about with the Republican Front. Um, that was launched in for the second round of the uh, legislative elections was actually not approved by Macron himself, who ne didn't necessarily say that we should all vote against the radical right. He kept saying we should vote against extremist forces. So whether it's the radical right or if a candidate from the Popular Front will come from Mélenchon's party. So it is interesting to see that there's a lot of unpopularity coming from the Renaissance voters are coming from the central liberals, which I think will mean that anyone that comes from this party, so right now um, Macron is a lend up, so all his ideas to think of who his successor will be. Um, there's a high chance that it could be Attal, actually, because he comes uh, <laughs> ironically quite popular. Um, it was going to be really difficult for him to get over this Macron years. 
Um, as I was saying earlier, I'm currently in the field talking to farmers. I've been doing it for the last three weeks. And one of the key uh, rhetoric that I keep hearing is that they would vote for anyone that is not Macron or Macron's party. So I think what the big question is, who is going to be the, uh, the opposition? Who is going to go again? So if, let's say, it's going to be from a central liberal candidate, who's going to be against that? Of course, the first person who comes to mind would be Marine Le Pen. And I think she's the most uh, established party. She's incredibly entrenched locally. And this is something I witnessed a lot and that we can't be said for the popular, the, the left alliance, which is mostly strong in cities. And, and also for, for the radical right, they have won a lot of like municipal elections. So they have a lot of visibility in those local areas. And I think this party resonates a lot more with uh, a large segment of the population, given that we no longer have this fear of voting for the radical right, because it's just a party that we can try. So I would say the, the, it's going to be difficult to find who's going to oppose Marine Le Pen and also, more importantly, who's going to be able to win against Marine Le Pen, given how well established she's been in the last 30 years. Sounds, that sounds very sobering, but yeah, I. No, no. <laughs> um, so I'm aware of the time, and I want to make sure there's time, a little bit of time for Q and A. Um, so if you are obviously in the room, raise your hand before I get to you, Randall. And if you are uh, joining us on Zoom, feel free to raise your virtual hand or type up a question in the chat. That will work. Um, Randall, I saw your hand. Come my hand was up. Your hand is not I, I, I want to thank all of you. It was it's a really interesting discussion. I have two questions uh, that I'll try to be brief on. Um, Diane has introduced the idea of the mainstreaming of the radical right. I, I would be interested in knowing something about your understanding of the mainstreaming of the radical right's positions. Um, because we've been talking about parties, but not necessarily about shifts in party platforms. And I'm wondering if you have any reflections on that. And I will say that Simon, uh, for instance, Matz and the CDU um, really represented radical shift to the radical right by the center, and I think Manfred Weber. I'd be interested in knowing something of what, what that looks like from your perspectives. And the other um, question I have is that Gaza has come up a number of times in the conversation here, but I'd be interested in a little bit more um, analysis there, because it feels to me that one of the things that's interesting in what we're talking about is the way that he's fired up. It's not as bad as the, the politicians are representing something that is not necessarily in line with the electorate. Uh, and that is to say, the, 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 the opinion polls show the, the electorate prepared to be critical of Israel's prosecution of the Gaza campaign, the Gazan war, uh, much more than the politicians are. Uh, and, and Germany is a great example of that, but it's across the board, the Netherlands, et cetera. I'm wondering if you might give us some more analysis of it, in particular, thinking about the way that Marine Le Pen um, uh, tried to march with uh, against anti-Semitism, while at the same time in the, in the Rassemblement, there there is a there are candidates, and uh, there was a particular candidate who was wearing an SS uniform as a joke. Uh, so you have a kind of anti-Semitic party uh, being pro-Israel, and these kinds of complexities of the love to hear a little bit more impact. Thank you. Two great questions. Thank you. All right. Who would like to tackle one or both of those? <laughs> um, I, I can start. I can um, quickly talk a little bit more about this, what I mean about the mainstreaming of right-wing policy. So it's more about not just having the radical right in power, but having this kind of policies being implemented, not necessarily by the radical right. And I'll give you an example in France. So in 2023, there was this immigration law that was passed by Macron's government. So Darmanin, who's the Minister of Interior, and he proposed a policy that put a moratorium on immigration, uh, facilitate deportation, reduce family reunification, a very hard line stance on, on immigration. The first party that approved this policy and said it was the right way towards uh, was it sanity was Marine Le Pen. She was the first party to actually applaud this policy being implemented. 
And that, I mean, is to me is a sign of the, the mainstreaming of those policies that are shifting to the right. And I think this is the, the gamble that Macron is doing now. He wants to secure social economic policies. And he knows by doing that is only to have someone from the right. And he's really by doing this to concede on other more controversial and given this kind of immigration uh, issue. Um, I will just say one point on your second question on the, this paradoxical image of what uh, this idea of anti-Semitism, and it's true. I mean, we need to remind us of that the Front National in 1972 was uh, launched by um, anti-Semitic uh, uh, people, and now he has become a pro, or hasn't really become, I would say, it's not so much that, it's so much much more about the rhetoric and how they're trying to um, which their rhetoric around one common enemy, which is the Muslim population. And that by doing so, you align different segments of the population. And now that the national rally has gone so much, so big and attracts different segments of the population, it's also starting to uh, attract this, uh, the Jewish part. Yeah. Mm. Can, I, can I say something? Certainly. Um, I mean, I think, Obviously, there has been a mainstreaming of radical right policies on immigration in the UK. I mean, uh, the Rwanda scheme was just about the most radical uh, proposition by any mainstream government uh, in Europe uh, when it came to handling immigration. It's important to stress for people who don't know that not only were people supposedly going to be sent to Rwanda for processing, but even if their asylum claims were accepted, they were going to spend the rest of their lives in Rwanda. They weren't going to be able to come to the UK uh, after being granted asylum. So it was a pretty radical policy. It never actually came off, despite the £700 million that the government spent on the policy. Only four people voluntarily went there. And we're not sure where they ended up either. Um, but you can also see it, I think, in the rhetoric of the Conservative Party and the Conservative government surrounding you know, what they call woke issues so you know concerns about uh, transgenderism etc etc um, and you can also see it i think in terms of rishi sunak's not complete u-turn but at least um uh, beginning to sort of move away from uh, a very strong stance on net zero that you saw under boris johnson uh, for example so in, in all those ways i think we have a conservative party that to some extent is responding to the threat from the radical right but of course is uh, encountering what many mainstream conservative parties encounter when they do this. All they do is simply um, up the salience of those issues. Uh, and uh, to borrow from the French, you know, people uh, tend to prefer the original to the copy. Uh, so it hasn't really done them um, very much good. I think on anti-Semitism and, and Gaza, I mean, it is a particularly difficult problem for the Labour Party in the UK uh, because uh, one thing that the party became associated with during the Corbyn years was uh, anti-Semitism uh, and uh, Keir Starmer has made it his mission to do something about what he um, has referred to as the stain of anti-Semitism and try and um, get rid of it from, from the Labour Party, which I think has probably, in the view of some people anyway within the Labour Party and the people who have left the Labour Party, led him perhaps to be rather more uh pro-israel um particularly early on in the conflict than, than might otherwise have you know have been the case from a human rights lawyer uh which is keir starmer's background um i mean the labor government is is now in trouble in in some ways from people uh who are very supportive of israel because once they come into government they've actually revoked some of the licenses uh, for arms sales to israel on the basis that they can be used uh, in in Gaza and and rather than um, in defending Israel against you know foreign uh, adversaries, so I mean I, I think the Labour Party unfortunately is sort of damned if it does, damned if it doesn't, uh, and it is facing a Green Party that is you know very very hot on Gaza, facing some internal problems from people who are very hot on Gaza, uh, facing these independents who were elected in you know Muslim. Um, constituencies or constituencies with large Muslim populations who are obviously very exercised about Gaza uh, too and it is also facing to be honest a conservative party which is trying to make the most uh, of this uh, very staunchly pro-Israel uh, rather than you know, seeking what many people would see as a kind of balanced 
uh, position. Um, but I think Randall's point is really interesting. I mean, if you look at the opinion polls, uh, certainly there is an awful lot of concern among British people, whatever their uh, political affiliation, about you know the the cost in human life um, in in uh, given what's going on in Gaza. And, and politicians aren't really reflecting that, to be honest. Not many of them, anyway. Um, and that's partly because, obviously, you know, Israel is seen as a pro-Western ally in the middle of a, you know, very, very um, important region um, to, uh, you know, both the, the defence, if you like, of the West and, and the West's economy. Yeah. So that's over to me then. Okay. Uh, on. Uh, I'm start with Gaza. I mean, ahead of the European elections, we not only saw the big farmers' elections, we saw massive demonstrations on Gaza in many capitals and cities right across Europe. And what was quite interesting in the election results themselves that this was the dog that didn't bite in the elections. It was it was really absent from the results, absent from the campaign. And I think this is largely mainstream left parties were torn and split in the way that that Tim alludes to and the way also we've seen in France within the NUPS coalition in France, we've seen the socialist Glucksmann, a, a lead candidate for the socialists in France, the election was very critical of Mélenchon and his anti-Semitism, um, or perceived anti-Semitism, and so there was this, uh, you know, the, the, there was a divide amongst the left um, on, on, on what position to take ahead of the elections in many countries, and that, that's a deep division that's very difficult for the left. Um, Interestingly enough, I mean, you know, we talk about uh, students mobilizing in universities all across Europe, demanding that we divest. And we've had this uh, at the EUI and I had it at, we had it at LSE. Um, actually, one thing they're not demanding, because maybe a political education issue, is they're not demanding that Europe suspend the EU-Israel free trade agreement. I mean, if you really want to punish Israel, that's one thing that would be pretty dramatic. I mean, the US provides the arms, Europe provides the economic um, access so so but it's interesting how it's not moved beyond kind of rhetorical things like divest to real policies to sort of really constrain israel and, and what it does and so it's largely it's quite easy i think for mainstream left parties to ignore the demands of, of, of a lot of the student movements or young people's movements across europe on the mainstream it, mainstreaming of the right agenda absolutely right i mean the one issue where it is really mainstream is immigration all the way across to many mainstream parties on the left. We had Starmer here in Italy last week meeting Maloney to say, how can she learn? How can Britain learn from Maloney's offshoring of migrants to Albania? Um, he doesn't want Rwanda, but he wants something like Rwanda. It's quite astonishing. And and we've seen it with the Danish uh, Social Democrats, now a very anti-immigration party. We've seen it now in Germany with SPD in Germany and its response to the, the elections. In so, so the mainstreaming of the anti-immigration rhetoric is all the way over to the mainstream centre-left. It's quite astonishing how far that has gone. Uh, mainstream centre-right, of course, got there first, and we've seen that in many elections across Europe. The parties themselves, or some of the parties, are still thought of as beyond the corner of Senate, like the AFD, particularly in Germany. Uh, but that's not the case in many other uh, countries all, all across Europe. I think environment will be next. I think we're starting to see a pushback on the environment issues, starting with the farmers. I wonder what uh, Diane is hearing talking to farmers in France about EU environment, red tape and costs being imposed. And I think mainstream centre-right parties like in Britain and CDU in Germany, now under pressure from the German car industry. Um, I think we've seen it in France with the backlash against, firstly, with the yellow vest demonstrations in France. And I think we've, we've, we're seeing it all across Europe, the mainstreaming of a sort of anti-environment. I think this, the radical right will, will, will have become you know, very opportunist in picking on that policy issue. And I think that they're going to push some of the the, the mainstream right, and I don't know how far that goes. It, it hasn't yet got to the mainstream centre left, but I think firstly it started with environment, with immigration, and now we're seeing it uh, with environment for sure. Diane, did you want to jump in? Um, I don't Yes, I want to jump in just to ask a question to Simon actually, because I I thought his uh, presentation was fascinating, especially on the green issue. Like you mentioned, that it's going to be very tricky in this new mandate for the green issues to be, uh, it could potentially be watered down. But I was just wondering, given that 
Um, the Green New Deal was enshrined in law in 2019. So there's not much that can be rolled back, except maybe when it comes to the budget. And then that we saw with Ribera being potential commissioner, and she's a really pro uh, environment and having also this, um, uh, I think it's with the agenda with uh, uh, competition policy and to try to make it really much about a green industrial policy like an IRA style. I was just wondering what could be your, what is your uh, views on this the green issue and what what how, what can the kind of radical right or anti green parties can really do in that most of the things have already been done. Yeah, it, it's true that a lot of the legislation is in place, but as is the case with a lot of EU packages or EU legislation, there's timing points for revisiting it. Yeah. So so if in over the course of this mandate, they they're going to revisit a lot of what they did, and also you know a lot of this was very framework type legislation. Mm -hmm with a set of targets for delivery that are that are beyond the term of this parliament. And so when they revisit them, I'm expecting them to water down those targets. That's the okay. sort of chat in Brussels. That's what the EPP are demanding. Um, and I think you're right. The, the, the big issue to try and keep it going and keep it on the agenda is to mix it with a sort of industrial yeah. policy perhaps even a protectionist industrial policy, which is, you know, we want to exclude goods from countries that are big polluters or, or, or you know, we already had that a little bit with the REACH directive the EU had in the yeah. past, which had quite big externalities in, in, in its impact. Um, so so I can see the, the basis, the basic structure of the Green Deal is there, but I think there's plenty of opportunity to cut away a bit at the edges mm -hmm. and to shape it in a very different way over the next five years. Where we are almost out of time, we have one more question for students. And I want to <laughs> <laughs> you may have to come. That's right. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so a question directed for, for Tim in particular. So we mentioned, or you had a discussion with Simon around the idea that there was not really a depreciated return at the margins. And I'm wondering to what degree uh, is that a consequence of strategic labor party targeting of competitive seats as opposed to safe seats? In the sense that I think it, it, it was quite apparent that uh, Starmer and the Labour Party in particular poured a lot of resources in competitive seats and depreciated, or at least in those sort of historical trends and how they pour resources, or less resources into safe seats. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right. That was a crucial part. Uh, of the explanation for um, you know the, the the way that Labour won so many seats uh, on such a low share of the vote, uh, it's been very clear really for the last two or three years that Labour has been pouring resources into uh, seats that it felt were competitive uh, in terms of taking them from the, the Conservatives. It was also actually very ruthless about um, not fighting. Uh, any real campaign in seats that were likely to go to the Liberal Democrats um, from the Conservatives. Um, I, I think it's also uh, the case that they were very ruthless also with their supporters during the election. So uh, there were several instances of um, Labour Party members who wanted to campaign in constituencies perhaps closer to theirs or perhaps in their own constituencies whose access to um, data was actually turned off by the Labour Party in order to very effectively force them, if they wanted to do any kind of campaigning, um, to go to the places where Labour wanted them to go to. So they were absolutely ruthless about doing that. And that, to some extent, is the explanation for uh, the, uh, the fact that they did so well in terms of siege uh, and not so well in vote share. I'm sure there are other questions, um, but we are out of time. This is a great conversation. Thank you to Tim and Simon and Diane. Um, I think everyone learned quite a lot. And we could, of course, continue this for another two hours, but we won't. not to worry. Um, and I will turn it over to Erica to have, for some concluding Yes, um, I just wanted to again thank our our, our uh, panelists. Um, I want to thank JJ um, and, of course, all of the people who are in the audience, both in person and um, virtually. Um, I want to alert you to the next um, Democracy Beyond the Ballot series um, event, which will be on October 22nd, which is Democratizing the EU. Is there a need for institutional reform? Um, and then before that, our next Conversations on Europe, which focuses, that series focuses on sustainability, will be on October 8th. Um, the topic is legal battles against ecocide, civil society, climate change initiatives, climate initiatives, and the judicial system. So I encourage you um, to attend 
any of those events. And again, thank everyone for coming in for a really um, fruitful discussion.